The act of writing a novel is an act of hope. That's something I was told by the professor of my novel writing course in college. The idea being that writing a novel is such a long, arduous, difficult process that demands so much time and effort that if one is so in the pits of despair to where they can't get out of bed in the morning, they're probably not going to be able to write a novel. To write a novel, you have to have some hope still left in you, some reason to keep going, some reason to believe that what you create will, in some way, make the world a better place. And I'd like to expand that idea a bit to the act of creating art is an act of hope. Because really the creation of any art is a long and difficult process that requires some hope to create. And it's that kind of art that I love the most, that art that trudges through the muck and the mud to find something worth fighting for, some light in the darkness. Art that can and does fully acknowledge the harsh realities of life while still finding a reason to push forward. I've talked about many of these kinds of stories on my channel, but probably my favorite is a little series of games I haven't talked about nearly enough. I love The Last of Us more than most things. Pretty much the only two things I love more than The Last of Us are my cat and Matt Reeves, and I am going to make a Last of Us 2 video because I love The Last of Us 2. And if that bothers you, well, I guess that bothers you. And that video, whenever it comes out, hopefully this year, is probably going to end up being the biggest video I've ever made and ever will make. It is going to be a gigantic love letter to a series of games that has so greatly influenced me both as a person and as a storyteller. But in the meantime, I wanted to talk about something else related to The Last of Us. Something smaller that I think could serve as a bit of a prologue to that eventual video. And what better than... Left Behind was a single-player story DLC for The Last of Us, taking place in between the end of the fall chapter and the beginning of the winter chapter. Left Behind sought to tell two stories. The story of how Ellie managed to save Joel's life after... <laughs> and the story of how Ellie originally got bitten, the event that would lead to the beginning of the original game. These are two stories that, in their own ways, are about losing people, how hard it can be, and why it matters. And losing people is such an important element of Ellie's character. In many ways, I think The Last of Us games are really about Ellie. Even when they focus on other characters like Joel or Abby, it's all ultimately meant to facilitate the story of the girl immune to the cordyceps infection. And I love Ellie. Ellie may very well be my favorite fictional character of all time. I aspire to write a character as likable, complex, imperfect, and sympathetic as Ellie from The Last of Us games. And I talked a lot about Ellie in my original Last of Us video all the way back in June of 2020. I talked about her optimism and her love for life. I talked about her curiosity and her excitability. But there was something, something really important to the character, that I only really kind of mentioned. She's scared that she's nothing more than either a liability or unwanted, because people only run away or die when they get too close. She can't help but believe that it's her fault if she dies alone. This is probably the most important part of Ellie's character, especially when it comes to how I understand her journey in The Last of Us Part Two. And I think that idea gets special significance in Left Behind, because Left Behind is, weirdly enough, the only Last of Us game where you play as Ellie the entire time. It's about the one thing that drives her, the fear of ending up alone. I'm scared of ending up alone. And that's what I want to talk about today. In preparation for that eventual video on The Last of Us Part Two, I want to talk about Ellie. I want to talk about who she is. I want to talk about what matters to her. I want to talk about how she sees herself. And to do that, I want to talk about her relationships with two people, relationships that are highlighted in Left Behind starting at the beginning. Back in Boston? Back when I was bitten? I wasn't alone. My best friend was there. And she got bit too. We didn't know what to do. So... She says... Let's just wait it out. You know, we can be all poetic and just lose our minds together. I'm still waiting for my turn. Ellie. Her name was Riley, and she was the first to die. 
Riley was a sort of elusive figure in the first Last of Us. There were really only two references to her in the entire thing. This one right here, and the Firefly pendant in Ellie's backpack. She was really only a name. Her defining quality was being, as Ellie put it, the first to die. But Left Behind decided to tell the story of Riley, giving her a face and a voice. Riley is a character who goes after what she wants. She's a bit stubborn, not unlike Ellie, but she's also generally more willing to take charge and make things happen. Meanwhile, compared to Riley, Ellie is awkward and more cautious. She has about the same amount of respect for authority, but she also recognizes their threat. In the simplest terms, and at the risk of overgeneralizing, Ellie is a follower and Riley is a leader. That's not to say that Ellie is entirely passive, Passive, just that she is certainly more passive than Riley. In fact, I think that's their central difference. It's only around Riley that Ellie is more willing to let her insecurities go and just have some fun, because she knows that Riley likes her as she is imperfections and all. Their relationship is unbelievably cute, is what I'm trying to say. It's hard to play this game and not just get swept up in their relationship and how much they obviously care about each other and make each other happy. Even though the story begins with Riley coming back after having just up and left Ellie behind months before, there's something endearing about how easily they fall back into the way things used to be. But it also makes the story all the more tragic. If you'd played the main game before this DLC, which you almost certainly did if you're playing the DLC, you already know how this story ends. You know that Riley and Ellie both, at some point, end up bitten, and you know that Riley turns while Ellie doesn't. And that knowledge hangs over you for the entire game, as you read off puns and try on silly Halloween masks and throw bricks at the windows of abandoned cars, you know that Riley will be the first to die. That dramatic irony is palpable the whole way through, and it's painful. It makes it difficult to take any joy in the good times when you know without any doubt that at some point it's going to end. So the question is why? What reason really is there to tell this story when we already know the ending? If we already know how this all ends up, what's the point of seeing it firsthand? And I think the reason is simple. It's about understanding Ellie. Ellie is a character defined by that fear of loss, defined by the knowledge that at some point she will lose people that she cares about. Whether they die or leave, the result is the same for her. Ellie lives through a kind of cycle. Be alone, learn to care about someone, be with them, lose them, and be alone again. And all Ellie wants is to stop the cycle in the middle, to have someone she cares about and who cares about her and not have to lose them. To feel the hope that this one will stay, this one won't die, this this one won't leave, and to not have that hope betrayed by circumstances out of her control. And if there's anything I love about Naughty Dog, it's the way in which their games help you to identify with the characters you're playing as. These games, Left Behind included, help you to see things from these characters' perspectives while still managing to separate you from them. They encourage empathy but still ask you to recognize that you are not the person you are controlling. A sort of video game equivalent to a close third-person perspective. You know how one character feels at all times, but there's enough distance between you and them that your feelings and the feelings of the character are entirely separate. Not necessarily different, but separate. And one of my favorite examples of this is a sequence very similar to one from The Last of Us Part 2, where Ellie imagines playing an arcade fighting game. You have to press the buttons, and you get some understanding of Ellie's imagination through sound effects, but the visual element is entirely up to the player. It's through this that we get to in some way identify with Ellie, but still recognize recognize our separation from her. We can't see into her head, just understand how she's feeling. But both Ellie and the player are dependent on Riley for this little bit of fantasy. There's a lot I love about this sequence, the pure innocence of it for one, just a girl who wants to play a video game coming the closest that she's ever come to doing it. But I think what I love the most is the way that this helps create this dependence on Riley for both Ellie and the player. Because for Ellie, Riley isn't just a friend, she's her only friend. As someone who has, admittedly, always had trouble initiating and maintaining friendships, I can tell you that your friend is a very different thing from your only friend. There is a reliance there, a need. As unfortunate as it is, you don't really feel like you exist beyond how you interact with that other person. It's Riley that enables Ellie to imagine this game, and it's Riley that enables Ellie to feel some joy when things feel their most dismal. It's Riley that makes Ellie feel 
real. And I want to take that idea and use it to talk about the other part of this game, the present day section where Ellie fights tooth and nail just to keep another person alive. Ellie drags Joel's body all the way to a nearby abandoned mall, leaves him inside of a yogurt shop, and the entire present day of the game is Ellie searching for medical supplies to stitch up Joel's wound and save his life. And just like with Riley, having played the first game, we know that Ellie succeeds. We may not know how exactly, but we know they both get out of this alive, and so there isn't much in the way of suspense when it comes to that particular plotline. We know, ultimately, how it pans out, so I ask again, why? Why do we need to see something that worked just fine when it was merely implied? Why couldn't this have just been the story of Ellie and Riley? Why have Joel there at all? And the reason here is that I think the story isn't asking will Ellie save Joel as much as it's asking why is Ellie trying to save Joel? And that seems obvious. She's trying to save him because she cares about him. There is ample evidence of that in the main game. What more reason does she need? But I want to look at this on a deeper level and not just take it at face value, because ultimately I don't think that's what the game is doing either. By juxtaposing this story with Ellie's relationship with Riley, we're forced to consider Ellie's motives in regards to Joel. This isn't quite as simple as just she cares about him, even if that is true. So then, why does Ellie want to save Joel? At this point in The Last of Us story, Ellie and Joel are really all each other have. Neither one has another connection or relationship outside of each other, and Joel is finally starting to let Ellie in and communicate with her. There are still boundaries he won't let her cross, but those boundaries are being clearly voiced and respected. They've come a long way from their standoffish beginnings and have come to the point where they're really starting to mean something to one another. In other words, they are currently at that halfway point in the cycle. They've learned to care about each other and they're spending time with each other and then Joel gets injured and the threat of the next stage in the cycle looms ever closer and that's what left behind is it's Ellie trying to prevent the cycle from moving onward to stop it in the middle exactly where she wants it to be because if she doesn't she'll be left alone and if she's alone she doesn't exist she doesn't matter the interesting thing about how Left Behind stages its narrative is that Joel is not just someone Ellie cares about, Joel is Ellie's purpose. She survives because Joel needs her to survive. His survival is what is driving her survival. Without him, she doesn't trust herself to know what she needs to do. After all, those were her last words to him before he passed out. But what she might know how to do is find medical supplies. What she might know how to do is stitch up his wound. What she might know how to do is take care of Joel when he needs her. One of my favorite moments in the game is this moment here where Ellie has been through hell just to try and get to this helicopter where there may be a first aid kit. And when she finally gets there, the helicopter shudders and almost falls but somehow manages to hold. She spots the first aid kit, crawls slowly and carefully to it, grabs it, opens it, and sees that it has everything that she needs to save Joel's life. She clutches it to her chest saying, I'm not letting you go. I'm not letting you go. It's the way she holds it like it is the most important thing in her life. They refuse to let it go because it is everything to Ellie right now. The point of all her struggles, her ability to save Joel. Because in the end, I think this is as much about how Ellie doesn't want Joel to die as it is about how Ellie wants to save him, wants to be capable of saving him, wants to be able to fulfill the need that Joel has for her. Because Ellie needs to be needed. She needs to have some purpose for somebody else, some qualifiable worth to somebody else. Because Ellie craves connection, but she could never believe that somebody simply wants her. As I said back in my original video, She's scared that she's nothing more than either a liability or unwanted. Because people only run away or die when they get too close. She can't help but believe that it's her fault if she dies alone. And doesn't it make sense? That if people always either die or run away if they get too close, how could anyone possibly want to get that close? How could anyone possibly want to be around her? In order for Ellie to have a relationship with another person, the relationships and connections that she's so desperate for, she needs someone to need her the way that Joel needs her. Not only in that he needs her to save his life, but in that Joel needs her to get that little bit back of what he lost all those years ago. Joel needs Ellie. 
and Ellie needs to be needed because she doesn't believe she could ever be wanted. And that brings us back to Riley because Riley has a secret, one that neither the player nor Ellie knows. They've asked me to leave. Leave what? Boston. I'm supposed to join a group in another city. I argued with them to stay here, but you know how Marlene is. Nothing's easy with her, everything's a test. They're picking me up tomorrow. Okay. That's it? Well, what do you want me to say? I don't know, how about some friendly advice? <laughs> I'm serious. Why did you bring me here? I wanted to see you. No, why did you bring me here? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <sighs> you want my advice? Go. Come on, let's just say our goodbyes. I'm gonna go check out this music. Riley! Riley! The sequence of emotions here is heartbreaking. The way that Ellie's joy turns to confusion, turns to ambivalence, turns to anger and frustration. The way that Ellie looks at this person that she loves and sees just another person who's going to leave. This isn't the inevitable death we know is coming. This is two people being torn apart by a world that can't accommodate them and their relationship, and neither of them know what to do or how to deal with it. Riley gave Ellie that hope again. It took so little to give her that hope again, and now here Riley stands, taking it away just as quickly as she gave it. It hurts a little bit how easily Ellie just accepts it, how used to this she is that she just wants to get it over with, say goodbye and leave it at that. She's not even willing to fight for it, however much it means to her, because in the end, she has been put in a position where she feels like she's just in the way. What Riley has told her here is that she doesn't need Ellie anymore, and what else is there for Ellie? And here I am again asking, why? Why does Ellie crave this human connection if it's only going to lead to this? Why fight so hard when her entire mindset has set her up for failure, when she knows that her purpose will eventually be fulfilled and therefore she will lose that someone she loves? Why keep trying when she knows this is the inevitable end? Ellie goes after Riley. She accuses her of feeling guilty for leaving, positing some kind of purpose for all of this, some need that Ellie needed to fulfill. She needed to give her an out. That's why she came. But Riley says that it wasn't guilt that brought her here, risking her life to do all of this. However, she still can't seem to properly communicate exactly what that is, so she changes the topic to the water guns she got back for them. And Ellie and Riley take one last shot at keeping it all together, a fun, innocent water gun showdown mired in this tragic sentiment that when it's over, that's it. That's the end for both of them. Once it's done, Ellie tells Riley that she thinks she should go, because it's what Riley wants, and this is her opportunity to have what she wants. Who am I to stop you? <laughs> the one person that can. Riley asks for Ellie's Walkman, and Ellie gives it to her. Riley, continuing to be unable to let go of this moment, goes and hooks it up to one of the speakers in the store they stand in. She starts dancing, gets Ellie to start too. Just another innocent moment for the two friends who want more than anything to not be left behind. Don't go. Such simple words that shatter everything we've known Ellie to be. In this moment, she's not trying to make Riley happy. She's not trying to fulfill some need for somebody else. For the first time, in this moment of pure innocence, she's asking for something for herself and no one else. This is what she wants. Don't go. And at this point, I think it's become obvious that's what Riley wanted too. That's why she came here. Ellie was the only one who could stop her from leaving. She needed Ellie 
because she wanted her. But of course, we know how this ends. We've known from the start. They run, they try to get away, and they get so close. They're literally at the window, but Ellie falls. She's attacked by infected, and Riley jumps down to save her and succeeds only to be attacked herself. So Ellie then saves her life, and then in the aftermath, when everything is calm and they are both somehow alive, they realize the truth we've been waiting for. This is how we knew this was going to end, and yet it still hits harder than I could have imagined. Because Ellie finally said what she wanted. She finally had enough of a belief in her own wants to voice them, and now it's over as soon as it's begun. And I know that Riley turns, and Ellie doesn't, and I know that Riley came back for Ellie and got herself bitten because she refused to leave Ellie behind, and I know that Ellie is going to take that and make her immunity the only part of herself that matters, because if it doesn't matter, then Riley died for nothing, because Ellie can't just believe that Riley would have died for her anyway, and I know that, because I know that I wouldn't. And I don't know why. I think a lot of the reason that I love Ellie so much as a character is because I see so much of myself in her. To desire that human connection so badly and not know how to find it or maintain it to only do what's best for other people because I'm not convinced that what I want matters enough to make it a priority. To watch it crumble and to wonder if it was always inevitable. A cycle that I knew would follow through and leave me right back at alone. And I sit here and I ask why, because the notion of why is a comfort. Why means something matter, and why means it had a purpose, why means that it needed to happen for some reason. But sometimes there's not a why. Sometimes things don't have a purpose. Sometimes things don't need to happen. Sometimes a piece of scaffolding falls over, and all of a sudden, Everything changes and the person you love becomes the first to die. Sometimes you lose people and you don't know why. And you hold on to whoever's left, fearing, knowing that one day they'll end up the same way no matter how hard you tried. But maybe, maybe the why doesn't matter. Maybe we just want to want each other. Maybe it's that simple. Maybe things fall apart. Maybe things end. Maybe people die. Maybe the world is full of maybes instead of whys. Maybe nothing is certain except for this. We will do everything we can if it means having each other. Even though we know it'll hurt open ourselves up to the worst possible pains, even though we know that we will probably destroy it ourselves, even though losing someone is one way or another inevitable. We keep doing it. And we don't need a why or even a how. Just a maybe. Maybe it'll be hard, but maybe it'll be fun. Maybe it'll hurt, but maybe It'll make you laugh, maybe it won't make sense, but whoever said that it had to make sense? Maybe it'll end, but maybe it'll be the greatest thing you've ever known. And maybe that's enough to make it worth fighting for. I know that Ellie has a lot of pain to go through yet, and we'll talk about that someday. She has a lot she needs to learn, and Left Behind leaves her in that place with Joel, looking forward uncertain of the future. And I know where forward leads. And I know there's no why down that road. But she goes on anyway, with nothing more than a maybe. And if I see so much of myself in Ellie, then maybe I can see that part of it too. The will to move forward on nothing more than a maybe, knowing that choosing to care about somebody isn't a certainty. It's a mess of love and pain and comfort and loss. It's an act of hope. <laughs>